Hi everyone, it's your girl Jade and you are about to look into our part two of our Youth Voices podcast about hate crime. As you saw in our last episode, we spoke to Festus, who is the Police and Crime Commissioner. And so we were able to gain his views as a professional dealing with hate crime. However, we spoke to the youth in the community and they wanted us to make sure that we also spoke with someone from the community who had lived and experienced hate crime and hate incidents so that we could gain more insight. So on this episode, we are joined by our very special guest, Zahara, and we asked her the questions posed by the young people of our community. I would now like to introduce you to Zahara. Hi, everyone. I'm Zahara and also known as DJ Dahab Lamode. Yes, And I'm here to represent, guys. Yes. So (laughs) today we're speaking about hate crime. Mm -hmm. So do you know what a hate crime is? Yes, I do. You do? So for the people, can you explain to them, for you, you know, your definition of a hate crime? Um, so my own personal definition of hate crime is being discriminated against your um, your race, your disability, your age and religion. But it's more to it as well. Um, it's just about something that you can't chase within yourself and the hate that comes with it. Yeah. And have you experienced a hate crime before? I've experienced hate crime since I was young. I grew up in the Netherlands in a village up north, so it was very, very racist up there. Really? Yeah. What was that like? Um, so we was actually the first Somali family in the village, uh, a black family altogether, and um, I've got a lot of things to talk about. I was chased plenty of times by racist people. Um, I was even left behind a year in preschool, first year, which is basically where children just play. Yeah. I was actually left behind a year for that because I was the only black child there. Um, growing up, it was quite different and quite hard in the Netherlands, 100%. Really? I thought they were more like quite diverse out there. It is, um, more so in the centre. Okay. Uh, like near Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Den Haag, that kind of place. Yeah. But outside of there, up north, even up to now, if you go there, it's very racist. Wow, I didn't know. And do you feel like you have also, you know, experienced, I guess, discrimination when it comes to hate crime because of your gender as well? Or do you know anybody that's experienced, like, hate crimes because of gender or disability? or Through gender, it was more so within my Somali community. Okay. um, And ageism as well. So Mm -hmm. being a woman, and I, I grew up quite loud and opinionated, and I always had things to say, especially when I see something wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, in the Somali community, there's a lot of things that I um, spoke up about, and I will get shut down because of I'm a woman, one, and oh she's young, so why would you want to listen to somebody like that? even now, like when I was in Luton about four years, four years ago, I started my organisation and I tried to get the Somali community involved. Yeah. Um, and I was doing it my own way. And because I did it myself, they um, they said um, this organisation is run by a young Somali woman. A woman shouldn't lead an organisation like that. We shouldn't trust. Um, we shouldn't trust our young ones with somebody like that. Yeah. So they actually started spreading rumours, um, stopped my organisation. Um, a lot of young people stopped talking to me as well, really? just because I wanted to help the community. I'm really sorry that that happened. I really, really commend as well. We were speaking before and I really commend the things that you do. I just want to put, make sure you know, like, you're doing bits. <laughs> this is team do bits, I, I promise. Um, now, I know that some people, you know, have, you know, um, fear reporting hate crime. Um and, you know, I was speaking to somebody earlier and I was saying, you know, to them that even down to, like, hate crime when it comes to, like, disabilities, it, it starts in the playground. Mm-hmm. So, um, like, for me, growing up in school, I feel like some people would would bully somebody because they, they might have certain disabilities, like learning difficulties, or they might, you know, um, 
I don't know, somebody might be on the spectrum, on the on the um, autistic spectrum, and people, I guess, didn't understand then. When I'm growing up now, I feel like they didn't understand. What do you think we could maybe do in the early stages of um, life, I guess, when it comes to children to, I guess, prevent hate crime and hate incidents? Um, so touch and base on the the disability side of things. So mm. I, I grew up, I have ADHD myself. Okay. So growing up, ADHD, going to school and not speaking English because I went from Netherlands to here, 12 years so old. So you were speaking Dutch? I was speaking Dutch, no English, nothing. Which and I, I had dope, ag- by the way, that you can speak Thank other you. languages because now I see you're bilingual. <laughs> you can speak English. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely. Um, so going to school, speaking no English and having ADHD, I feel like... Um, I was actually bullied because they didn't understand why I was this loud, hyperactive child. Mm. Um, So even the students themselves wouldn't even want to talk to me or spend time with me because I would overspeak them. And I don't mean to be rude or anything, but it's just my condition and Mm -hmm. and they weren't aware of it. I wasn't even aware of it at that age. So I'm here overspeaking them. Nobody really wants to spend time with me because I was so energetic. I was loud and I, I was always jumping from one thing to another. And and I was basically alienated for that because um, they didn't really understand. I don't, I don't blame these young people who have bullied me because mm. like we said early on, we touched base on it. They don't know any better. And it's one of those things where... Um, if we have awarenesses from young, help young people understand that um, everybody's built differently. Not everybody mm. is the same, and people people react to things differently. Yeah, that's the that's the part that's missing in schools. It should have uh, people should already know. Well, how do I explain this? In school, we're told we're all the same. Yeah, and I feel like that's where we go wrong. We're not yeah. all the same. Yeah. We're very different. We all have our own life experiences. We've all gone through things differently. Like me, having to, um, growing up um, and having sexual traumas as mm. well, um, I did, couldn't even stand next to a male. And because of that, I was looked down upon other females because mm. I didn't want to talk to guys the way yeah. that they were talking to guys. Yeah. So it was pretty deep, yeah. Oh, girl. I was about to say, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Do you it's know what it is? <laughs> you see, you see somebody on the surface of things, and so had I somebody that I've seen like in the local area of back in the day, mm-hmm. and you see someone on the surface of things and think, oh, that's a cool person, and blah, blah blah, and you don't know what that person is going through or what they've experienced, especially when it does come to things relating to like hate crime I f- or hate incidents, and I feel like in one way or another, we've all kind of experienced those kind of things as well. Like you said, you you have adhd so because you had so much energy and stuff people didn't want to you know sit with you and stuff but they don't know and that is really good like like you said like schools need to educate people more that we we are different and you know we do have different life experiences so that you know how to deal with people differently Mm -hmm. according to who they are i feel like we should all tailor make um our experience with people based on their life experience and our life experience and make it that rather than it being treat everyone the same in terms of respect and morals and standards yes treat everyone the same but when it comes to like actually building relationships and friendships we have to look at things differently so i just appreciate that yeah yeah. because ever since i started really understanding my adhd i've been so understanding of other people when i see somebody angry I don't even look at it in a way of like um, they're angry at me. Mm. It's actually also got to do with them and how they they interpret in this very moment. Yeah. And a lot of times people take it personal. Yeah. And this is where it goes wrong. Um, it's about it's emotional interpersonal intelli- skills. You know? Yeah, emotional intelligence exactly. as well. I think a lot of people lack emotional intelligence when it comes to those things. 100%. Now, when you experienced those things when it came to like bullying because of your adhd and even like in the netherlands being chased and stuff because of your race and you know. i even got this in the netherlands i was stoned by muslims because i was black so i didn't really belong it was like i was in the netherlands i didn't belong anywhere finally i found a muslim community because i grew up muslim yeah i was like my, my, my muslim community at least they'll be open but it wasn't like that even them they really? were racist towards us because it was it was a battle never really belonging and again even being black i was never brought up being black i was yeah. brought up to believe i wasn't black yeah and that's that's what happens often in somali household mm. it's something that was taught like my mom only 10 years ago did she accept that she was african mm. and black Mm. but she got brought up believing that she wasn't mm. 
and being in that kind of crisis like it was it was a, a major identity crisis for me because again like I said I wasn't belonging in the, in the Muslim community because I was black because that's racism from, yeah. from them um, uh, in the black community I, w- I didn't belong either because we would get told straight you're Somali you're not black yeah. and I don't blame them either because us Somalis themselves told them mm. we are not black yeah. so they've adopted that now and yeah. a lot of times you actually ask somebody from Africa do you believe Somalis are black especially from the hood they'll tell you no they're not and it's still running through. Yeah. It's still there. So you tonight. have experienced uh, literally hate incidents and hate crime because of your race, because of your religion, and because, because of your, woman. because you're a woman, <laughs> because of because of your disability or yes. your st- difficulty as well. So you've mm-hmm. experienced a lot of the things across the spectrum of hundred percent. Yeah. What people could actually wow and what did you do like did you ever like report it did you ever speak to your family did you ever like what 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 was it well let's take it back to the netherlands was there any because it seems like it was just a community thing and people were just it was in some village like you said in the north so was there any process or anything because remember we're the same age so really you should have been able to report that but i am i was born and bred over here so no nothing was supported because um try to remember like in a lot of um african communities we are told to not speak to the government officials and that's mm. something that stuck by me since i was young I've always been told to not approach officials, uh, anything, government, even youth clubs we got told to stay away from. Really? Yeah, 100%. (laughs) Like, I remember there was a time, like, my mom, like, now she knows better. Like I said, last 10 years, my mom has, like, educated herself and started understanding Mm. more of the ways where she went wrong. And um, she now has, now she actually pushes us to do we are black we are african go and show them what the somali community is about she's actually one of my main one of my biggest cheerers at the moment but that took a lot of work yeah because my mom herself went through identity crisis it's a it's an ongoing it's a cycle that just keeps going and going so would you say then that um i guess reporting of things like hate crimes and actually standing up is also a part of i guess uh your self-esteem your self-worth being proud of who you are, mm-hmm. regardless of what your circumstances, your race, religion, creed, everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I think that's really important that you you know who you are. I think self confidence, self esteem is important to then of course. be able to stand up. And um, you know, I speak. I was speaking to our previous guest, and he said something similar. He said, you know, he's proud of who he is, and so when you're proud of who you are, and you set the example of how people should treat you, then they ought to treat you that way. And then if they don't, then you know that you have to now go and report those incidents and go and deal with those situations so that people know that they can't treat with you any which kind of way Mm -hmm. i mean now i have that mentality but it took a lot to get there yeah took a lot because i myself like i said like i've gone through sexual traumas i've gone to my gp my gp was one of my first places that i actually kind of opened up about my sexual traumas and he never took it further yeah. than that he just left it as that he never really referred me yeah and, and up until now i actually had to get help myself outside yeah. of the government so i i started criminology so when i graduated that's when i came out of it better because yeah. then i started to understand myself better yeah. as well and um now definitely i feel i feel like from young it should be we should be taught that it's okay to open up and and we need to have people in place who are relatable so me having to report when i was younger i would be reporting to a middle-aged white man for example yeah right that was not someone i would be willing to open up to yeah now that we know this i feel like these are the things i need to put in place there needs to be more relatable people in the force and other organizations where these young people can speak to it's like a bridge yeah between the government and and the young person yeah we gotta be in the middle to bring them together yeah and i feel like different services like in terms of what you do and what we do here so we've got the bedfordshire mediation service and this is where we actually you know have a platform where people can come through and gain like information and resources about hate crime and Mm -hmm. they can come through on the chat and speak to somebody and gain help and 
understanding in terms of what they need to do and if it's something that we don't directly do we can signpost them to the services mm-hmm. like you said your for example you went to your doctor your doctor is then meant to refer you we, we kind of do that we're not doctors but in terms of what the circumstances when it comes to a hate incident or a hate crime we can then refer you and say okay you need to speak to mm-hmm. if it's affecting your mental health it's stopping you from doing x y and z we can refer you to um total well-being for example where you can now speak to somebody about how it's affecting you and then they can give you guidance and advise you based on like your specific circumstance when it comes to hate crime i feel like like you were saying like in school you experienced i guess hate incidents and bullying one of the things were because of your adhd and obviously you just touched about them speaking about your adhd when you went to speak about like your mental health as well um how did you combat that like did you when when you experienced in that so we spoke about when you were in the Netherlands and obviously that was more difficult because you were told you know you don't speak to government officials and stuff like that so you've come over to England now you don't speak English you're dealing with ADHD as well which you weren't aware at that that time Mm -hmm. because I feel like it's harder as well to actually diagnose in girls till there are even women that are older now and they're like I think I have ADHD I have to because some women are even getting like diagnosed as women Mm -hmm. now because they didn't even know that they had it growing up because they didn't see the signs they just thought they were overachievers and over this and over Mm -hmm. that because a lot of women that have ADHD they're overachievers in school because they wanted to always get things right um one of the things like you said over talking people and all of these things so you've come to england now you're dealing with that how did you then combat that like did you speak to your parents did you speak to your mom somebody it was actually my sister it was my sister uh my older sister yeah Mm -hmm. i'm the youngest in my family my older sister she's the one that um was the first one to take the step towards um looking into her mental health Okay. So she basically showed me the way. She goes, we really need to look into our mental health. There's a lot of things that we don't know about, and there's a lot of things that we need to take into account. The reason why we react to things and like, um, like we react to things through trauma. Yeah. That's the one thing that I was that stuck by me that my sister said, even when we're um, having breakfast. Mm. and something is happening it will be a trauma response within a moment Mm. and that's what she touched figured out and then from there she got herself diagnosed and then um from there it was like and going back to when she was getting herself diagnosed my whole family was against it um my um my uncles aunties parents they were like this is nothing like why are you even wasting your breath on this like you don't need to get yourself checked out just go pray Mm. yeah that, that's the main thing go pray you, that's all you need you need god so um the way i dealt with it honestly it was through my sister and ourselves we didn't self-education mm. there was things i put in place to stop me from um being triggered um for example with my adhd when when i'm having a discussion with somebody i now know to keep my mouth shut even though i want to Mm. I'm ready to say a point. Mm. I I stay quiet and um and I look around the room quickly to bring myself back and mm. I'm back to the discussion because my r- mind is racing. Even right now, as I'm looking at you, I'm speaking to you, but there's other things going through my mind at the same time. Mm-hmm. So f- the way I come back into it is I look at you and I'm reading this at the same time. Pod mic. Mm. That's my way of bringing myself here to the it's now. It's like centering yourself. Yeah. Okay. So it's like little things that I put in place to support myself. But like I said, I haven't got no professional help up until now. I had to get the help myself through my own personal um, network. Mm. I've had um, psychologists. I've got friends who are psychologists who have had some counselling sessions with me mm. and um, gave me some tools to support me. Um, and that's one of the main reasons I opened up the organisation MOVE, mm. which is more than valid education. This is a place where um, we combat mental health, but it's not just about we don't show it, it's a mental health place. It's a creative place. Mm. So I'm a DJ myself and um, we're going to be running some workshops for young people to come and um, teach them how to turn their skills into a, um, a business, basically. Mm. So like I said, there's certain things that we've put in place. So this helped me. DJing has helped me yeah. be centred and mm. be in the now. And it's given me a way of like an outlet yeah because i used to box and i stopped boxing Mm. and since i stopped boxing i just went downhill and then now that i started djing 
it made me centered. Mm. So this space that we're creating now is for young people to just come and be creative. But would you like to, for example, would you like to become a DJ? In order for you to become a DJ, you now need to work on yourself, your mental mm. health, your confidence, mm. who you are as a person. Mm. And then we can help you with your skills and yeah. turning it into a, a business. That's dope. Yeah. I think it's dope. I feel like if, um, if you, if you obviously in the past because of the i guess stigma when it comes to dealing with the government and stuff obviously you wouldn't have reported it if like you could tell your younger self something now about like reporting hate crime like like being stoned that's so like ancient that's something you hear that's like unheard of like people being stoned and these kinds of things especially in a in a a european country as well Mm -hmm. so like what would you tell your younger self in terms of reporting it and like i guess being brave to report it now or maybe like if or if you were over here would you have reported it and and also do you feel like there are still barriers in reporting hate crime and speaking to you know the police and stuff so younger me i would say um trust other people outside of your community Mm. Because, like I said, I've, I've always been brought up to believe, to trust only the people in my community and end up being my community that hurt me the most. Mm. So um, I would tell my younger self, you know, trust trust others to... Like, there are genuine people out there who do want to help. Because the first youth club I went to, I only stepped into it once. Stepped into it and I walked back out because it didn't feel relatable. I wish I stayed because... When I turned 27, I went there to do a mentorship course and then I actually saw mm. for myself what the work they were doing and stuff. Yeah. And I was like, wow, a lot of people from our community could benefit from this. Mm-hmm. But young me ran away from that because... Was that up here? Yeah, here in, in Luton. Luton. Yeah, Greenhouse Mentoring. Um, they actually helped me do my mentoring course and that's when I that's when it really clicked. And I was like, these people actually want to help. Mm. Young me ran away from the same people, mm-hmm. the same group of people. I ran away because mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God white people sorry to say that but that's how it was yeah. i was i was 13 years old your, that wasn't your you know, and i was the only black to... person there as well so i was like oh my god i'm staying away from this this is not my kind these people are your kind yeah. it's just th- it's just the melanin that's yeah. the only difference there is it's just a different skin tone that's all it is we have different cultures but we're all the same i just judge them as a whole or as a bad as a they're all bad which because, of your experience, yeah. because of my experience because try to remember i got chased yeah. by white people growing up i got stoned i got there's a lot of things that happened to me in the hands of racism so coming to england i was just like i don't trust them mm. i don't trust nobody but mm. i wish i did i wish somebody older told me you know your life experience i know what's happened to you has happened but not everybody is like that and you can't judge a whole race mm. over that because i know plenty of black people who are way more racist than white people and do you do you feel like it was maybe like a full circle moment then? Because now you're saying that you've gone back to them since and you went and did some work with them. So perhaps that was, it's unfortunate in a way, but like maybe certain things were meant to happen to make you then full circle back to mm-hmm. that space and that place. Yeah, hundred percent. And I'm so grateful I did. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, it was my auntie that actually pushed me towards doing it. And I was still saying no. And then mm-hmm. when I went, I signed up. That's when I was like, oh, actually. I'm actually quite happy I've signed up for this because I yeah. gained a lot of valuable skills. Yeah. And I was like, well, these are people who are now putting in money to young people to help other young people. Yeah. So they must really care. Yeah. They must really care. Each one to each one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is there anything that you have to say to the viewers regarding reporting hate crime, uh, making sure that they get the help that they need, um, or just any last words that you might have? I would yourself? say, you know, if you do not do not feel comfortable talking to the government officials, there are people like us here that you can speak to and get referred to, referred from. Like, um, the first step is always the hardest, but once you've taken that first step, everything else just smoothly follows. Because trust me, I could have saved 10 years of heartache if I, had <laughs> mm. if I had done this 10 years ago. Now that I'm in it and I see the support that's out there, there are people like me and you who do want to help others. So just be open to it and just, you know, life is about experiences. Bad things happen, but good things happen too. And you just got to focus on the good, really. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so today. much I for having you. me. Thank you so much for having me. I My really pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys, for watching. And until next time, see you later.
you would like to find out more information or if you are experiencing a hate crime or a hate incident, please visit the Bedfordshire Community Mediation Service website at communitymediationservice.com.